Good morning, Bob here with a short thought or two, continuing our theme of looking at the book of Psalms. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the world of football commentary, but uh, football commentators are well known for coming out with uh, their own sort of funny little phrases. Uh, And one of the phrases over the years I've heard quite a lot is to describe a match as a game of two halves, which to me and anyone else is completely stating the obvious. Uh, But what they're actually talking about is the fact that the game, the teams that turned out in the second half may as well have been completely different teams to those that turned out in the first half. And if you try to predict the end of the game, the result, based on the first half performance, you'd have got it completely wrong because everything was just completely different in the second half of the game. And I guess you could describe this psalm as a psalm of two halves. It starts with a sense of abandonment and despair, but ends with this great sense of completion, of a job done, something well finished. The passage you're looking at today then is Psalm 22. And I remember reading this psalm, coming across it uh, as a student, a young student uh, and a fairly new Christian, and being completely fascinated by uh, these verses written hundreds and hundreds of years before uh, Jesus uh, and before crucifixion was invented as a terrible way of execution by the Romans, but describing nevertheless somebody being crucified. It uh, is attributed to David, uh, and so it would have been written about a thousand years before the events it seems to describe so graphically. And it is therefore in in many ways a prophetic psalm, a very particular kind of psalm. And and doubtless uh, in some measure it describes, it would have described what was going on in David's life at the time that he wrote these words. But it also looks forward through time to describe the experience of another. This is quite a long psalm, 31 verses in total, uh, and David's going to read it to us in a moment. Um, But as he does so, look out for those passages that that describe the death of Jesus uh, that we read in the New Testament uh, Gospel accounts. The psalm starts with this desperate cry from the heart, and it goes on with a mixture of prayers and words of faith, and then to this harrowing description of rejection, humiliation and suffering before turning again to faith and hope and ending in praise and worship. The final four words of verse 31 to me though uh, are particularly powerful as we see this in the light of what Jesus achieved for us in his death on the cross. So over now to David who's going to read Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Verse 1 to the end. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? O my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust you trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey 
open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like pochard, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil men has encircled me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honour him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him. He has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. For he has done it. Thank you, David. It always amazes me in this psalm the number of references to what Jesus went through for us on the cross. And there's a lovely passage in the book of Luke, uh, towards the end of this book, uh, in chapter 24, where Jesus uh, appears to a couple of rather de dejected disciples as they're walking from Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus. Uh, they don't recognise him. They don't realise that Jesus is actually walking along with them. And as they tell him, he asks them why they're so sad, so dejected, and they tell him about all the terrible things that have happened in Jerusalem, about Jesus and his death. Uh, and then these rumours of resurrection, but uh, clearly, as far as they were concerned, it was just uh, people hoping, hoping that uh, it wasn't all over. And Jesus gently rebukes them. And as they walk along in Luke 24, 27, it tells us this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And I wonder if on, in all those many, many uh, Old Testament passages, Jesus might have included this psalm, Psalm 22, as part of his description of what he would have had to go through uh, to complete the task that was given to him. As we go to this psalm, the first verse immediately takes us to Matthew 27 and verse 46, where Jesus, hanging on the cross, it says, cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then David's reference to being scorned by everyone, despised by the people, all who see me mock me, takes us to Luke 22, verse 63, where the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking him and beating him. And then again in Luke 23 and verse 11, we read that Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. David writes then about those shaking their heads and mocking 
his trust in the Lord to deliver him. Uh, and then we read in Matthew 27 verses 42 and 43 the mocking of the crowds. He saved others but can't save himself. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. And David talks of uh, his mouth being dried up like a potsherd, like a dry piece of baked clay. And it reminds us of Jesus crying out on the cross in John 19 verse 18. I am thirsty. And then we really get the message in verse 16 of Psalm 22. When David writes, they pierce my hands and my feet. This isn't about David now. This is about Jesus nailed to a cross. John 19 verse 18, there they crucified him. But there's more. It goes on. They divide my clothes uh, among them and cast lots for my garments. Did this really happen to David? Uh, there's no record of any such event happening in, in the Bible, in the accounts of his life in the Bible. Of course, it may have happened in something that uh, wasn't documented. Uh, but um, it isn't there for us to read about in his life. But it certainly happened to Jesus. Luke 23, verses, uh, verse 34, the second half of verse 34. And they divided up my clothes by casting lots. And then the psalm turns to praise and worship and ends with this amazing statement at the end, those wonderful four words at the end of verse 31. He has done it. And so we read in John 19 and verse 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He has done it. This is the psalm of Easter, the psalm of the cross and the resurrection. It is a psalm of despair and desperation, prayer and supplication and praise and adoration. This is a psalm of two stories interwoven. Uh, the story of David, a low, low point in his life. We don't know at what point in his life he would have written this psalm. I guess there are, uh, there are some incidents that we read about in, uh, in the Bible, the account of his life. Uh, that were low they were really low points uh, but whether any of them were, were low enough for him to be writing what he writes in this psalm who who can say um, uh, but overlaying this is the image of one who would follow David generations later one who will be born to a descendant of David about a thousand years after he lived this was one whose suffering would change the destiny of humankind. As David suffers this great sense of despair and abandonment in whatever he's uh, going through, overlain upon his story is the story of another who would be truly abandoned by God, upon whom God the Father would turn his back, not because he wanted to, but because he had to. As Jesus hung upon the cross and took upon himself my sin, my wrongness, my rebellion, my poor, stupid, short-sighted, selfish attitudes and decisions, the Father could no longer look upon him, could no longer look upon his Son. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, could no longer comfort him or support him. He was forsaken, abandoned by the one whom he had been part of since the beginning of time. And we see such despair in Jesus on the cross, not just the agony of his back torn apart by the lashes he'd received only hours before, his head bruised and blooded by the crown of thorns pressed upon it and, uh, and the beatings he'd sustained at the hands of the soldiers, uh, but then his body stretched out, nailed onto a cross, lifted up, and dropped into the ground, his hands and his feet pierced. And then at that point when he would have needed help and comfort uh, more than at any other time in his whole life, the father turns his back as he receives upon himself the fallenness, the brokenness, the sin of humankind, my sin and your sin. The father turns his back and the Holy Spirit departs from him. The Bible reveals to us in the pages one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. A relationship so close, so entwined, so full of love that they are completely and utterly one 
one God. But as Jesus takes our fallenness, our brokenness upon himself on the cross, as he dies in our place, the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit is broken, separated. The unthinkable happens, the inconceivable. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What anguish. But what great sorrow and pain in the Father's heart too, to have to turn his back on the Son that he loved. What grief to the Holy Spirit as he has to leave Jesus to suffer alone when everything in him was to help the broken, the needy, the humble, the suffering. When was anyone more broken? When was anyone more in need? When was anyone more humiliated and in greater suffering than Jesus the Son upon the cross? The psalm brings this story, this event that would happen a thousand or so years later and overlays it on David's suffering, sort of interweaves it into what David is going through as he writes these words, his time of suffering, his sense of abandonment. And in this, in this interweaving, we see that God is closer to David in his pain and suffering than he could ever imagine. Jesus, though not yet revealed to the world, unknown as yet to David, was with David in his hours of suffering and pain. For me, the heart of this chapter lies between uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me in verse 1 and that final victorious uh, uh, short passage in, at the end of verse 31, he has done it. Uh, it lies in the words of verse 24, which says this, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. He has not just not despised nor scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has gone there ahead of us. He has gone way beyond, way further in affliction and suffering than we could ever go or would ever be required to go. Somehow in his description, David found his story overlapping, interwoven with the story of this wonderful future king. Whatever you're going through now, know this for absolute certain. Jesus died for you, was crucified and died in your place. When you receive this incredible gift of salvation, purchased at such great cost, your life, your story becomes interwoven with the story and the life of Jesus. Your sin, my sin, becomes his righteousness. My death, our death, becomes his life within. My emptiness and aimlessness becomes his fullness and his purpose. Let us pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you for these words in this wonderful book, Lord, in the Old Testament, written hundreds of years before you went through what you did for us. We thank you for David, Lord. We thank you for his experiences. We thank you that you were with him in everything that he went through, oh God. And thank you that you're with us, Lord, that you promise never to leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, so in this season, at this time, we just pray, Lord God, would you come? Would you reveal yourself once again to us? Reveal the cross. Reveal all you did for us. Reveal again, we pray, your sense, this sense of you being so with us, so close to us. Lord, we thank you. Amen. Thank you for listening.